Subscribe our channel and press bell icon to get the notification of new video. Like this video. Join our WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1. You will hear a university student radio station broadcast. First, to look at questions 1 to 6. And it's a bright sunny morning here at Portsmouth University Radio, the radio station that brings you all the news and lots of the fun non-news from our wonderful campus and the city we live in. I'm your host, Mike, and with me is... Rita. Hi, guys. So, Rita, what's on the menu this morning? As usual, Mike, we'll start off with the most important, most exciting and interesting news for all those thousands of our highly intellectual, very serious listeners. Sports! Right. Good news from the women's soccer team last night, I hear. Sure is. They thrashed Southampton by, would you believe it, not four, not five, but six goals to nil. Nothing. Zero. So the team's looking good for the Southern England University League that starts this Saturday. Did you see the game, Rita? I wanted to, but was stuck in the lab, playing with rats. See the game? Against our closest rivals? Do you think I'd have missed it? Great game. So, who scored? No surprises here. Molly and Baker scored the first three, all in the first half. Susie Smith, last year's top scorer, hit the net five minutes into the second half, followed two minutes later by Joan Michael. Then Molly finished off the massacre just before the final whistle. Fantastic players. Great team. All our listeners know Susie Smith, of course, the blonde dynamite, and Joan Mitchell from last year. But Molly is new on campus, a first-year postgraduate medical student, all the way from Ghana, where she played for the national team, top scorer. An amazing 25 goals in international matches last season. African Woman Player of the Year. Look at questions 7 to 10. She's fantastic. She came very close to scoring more, but Southampton hemmed her in really tightly after they saw what she can do. I heard she could turn professional tomorrow if she wanted to, but prefers to enjoy the game as an amateur and study to become a doctor. That's true. OK, and how about the men's soccer team, Mike? Do I have to speak about this, Rita? A disaster. Played away at Bristol. I won't be surprised if some of them are too embarrassed to come back. Lost 6-2, and Bristol had their best two players watching from the sidelines because of injury. Let's change the subject. Good idea. No other sporting news today, but lots coming up this weekend. Now to the bad news from the students' union. Really bad news. Prices in the cafeteria and bar are going up by an average of 10%, as from Monday. 75p for a cup of coffee. Four pounds for a pint of bitter. My favourite beer. So, complain. There's a demonstration planned for outside the Students' Union building at noon tomorrow. See you there. And you can phone us now, 8759765, to tell us what you think. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear an address given at the annual meeting of an international computer company by the company president. First, look at questions 11 to 16. Good morning, fellow members of the board, staff members, and our dear stockholders. Welcome to our sixth annual general meeting. It is my pleasure to give you an overview of how the Orange Computer Company has done in the past year. When I have finished, we will be very happy to answer any questions you might have. Most of what I have to say is very encouraging, but to get it over with, I'll start with the bad news. Actually, it's not too bad. This time, a year ago, we told you that we were about to launch our first mobile phone line, cell phone for our American friends. After a major promotion, our four mobile phones hit the market exactly one week later. Given our excellent company reputation, very promising results from our market research, and what we thought were attractive winning features at very competitive prices, our competitors were ready and waiting, with new models at prices that we had to match. So match them we did, but given the difficulty of breaking into this market, sales have been disappointing both in Europe and especially in North America. Given the massive growth of China's mobile phone production in recent years and our lack of experience in that part of the world, we did not market the phones in Asia. So our mobile phone subsidiary is still limping along, but sales are slowly growing. We believe the long battery life and reliability are beginning to have a larger impact on consumers. So we have planned a new promotion and marketing campaign stressing these two strengths. Our research also shows that after only a few weeks, most purchasers of the fanciest, most expensive mobile phones end up only using the basic functions, phone calls, messages, and chatting. So we will be appealing to the more conservative consumers, those who look for reliability rather than those who feel they need to always have the very latest and most complicated models. We are confident that we will soon build a strong position in this target market. Now look at questions 17 to 20. Now for the good news. As you can see in the annual report, total group income from sales increased to just over 1.83 billion euros, a very healthy 9.5%, and net profit after taxes increased to 126 million euros, or 18%. So you can look forward to a significant rise in share dividends and an even bigger increase in the value of your stock holdings in Orange Computers. Let me briefly describe the main reasons for our even better than expected growth and profits this past year. One is the fruits of our merger four years ago with Ribbon Optical, Europe's largest camera and CCD maker. Our decision to get into the high-end digital and professional camera market has proven to be the right one. We have been particularly successful in the medical imaging field. Starting from nothing three years ago, our equipment is now being used by 12% of Europe's hospitals, and we have already, after just 18 months, made a promising entry into the North American market. In fact, just yesterday, 
We signed a $1.2 million contract with one of America's best-known medical schools. Another major reason for a very profitable year was the increased outsourcing of our programming to India and China. This has resulted in very significant cost reductions on our software side. And I am happy to tell you that we managed to increase the proportion of the programming we outsource without laying off any of our European programming staff, who we keep for those software and platform projects that we wish to keep most closely to ourselves. Efforts to increase energy efficiency have also reduced costs. We are also pleased that our decision, explained to you at our meeting a year ago, to stick to our core business and not to enter such areas as games, playstations, music, MP3, and the like, mobile phones were the one exception, is, in our opinion, proving correct. The competition is very fierce in these fields, with minimum returns, and in the case of the music side, extremely costly in legal fees. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation between Mary and Mr. Hayes, one of her former high school teachers. First, listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Mr. Hayes. It's so great to see you again. Mary, one of my most favorite students. So, how are you? Well, to be honest, Mr. Hayes, not so good. That's why I wanted to see you. It's about university. So different from high school. Oh, dear. Well, why don't we sit down over there and you can tell me all about it? Let's see if I can be of any help to you. Oh, dear. I feel so stupid now. I shouldn't have bothered you. Don't be silly, Mary. We all need someone to speak to sometimes. And since your mother and father are in New Zealand, you probably feel a bit lost now and then. But before you say anything else, why don't you tell me the, all the things that you like about your new life at university? Gee, I don't know. I guess I like the city. Canterbury Cathedral is one of my favorite places. I often go there just to sit and think. Or just sit. Oh, I can quite understand that. And you've got the sea. I love the sea. And you are never more than a short cycle ride from the lovely Kent countryside. And how are your teachers? Oh, the profs are great. Not as good as you, but really interesting and always ready to explain things after class. But I don't know. They're really good. But I just can't seem to feel enthusiastic about studying anymore. Mary? Not a keen student anymore? My dear, that's so hard to believe. You were always so energetic and interested in all your studies, except German, if I remember correctly. But you still did very well in it. And you always wanted to major in biology, which is what you're doing now. Do you still enjoy biology? You now have some time to read questions 26 to 30.
I don't know. I suppose so. But I kind of have to force myself to go to lectures and stuff. It all seems like, like a waste of time. Pointless. Mary, I think I know you quite well. You are obviously not feeling yourself. Are you feeling sad or worried about something? Not really sad, and I don't think I'm worried about anything in particular. It's just that nothing seems worth bothering with. Have you spoken with your mum or dad lately? Not since Easter. I send them emails, but they hardly ever reply, and they are never in when I try to phone them. Always out filming. Yes, Mary. That is sometimes the problem with very successful parents. They get so wrapped up in their work that they neglect their kids. Not intentional, but it happens. I guess, but at least I could speak to them sometimes when they were here in London. But now, well, I feel really alone at Canterbury. Have you made any friends there, Mary? You were always such a popular person here. It seemed you were in every club and sports team, president of the chess club. Have you joined any university clubs? Not really. Suppose I should. I'll check out the debating society once I get back. That's a good idea. Let me know how you get on. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture about the achievements of the ancient Aztecs of Central America. You now have some time to read questions thirty-one to forty. Good evening. Good to see so many people here to learn about the fascinating civilization of the Aztecs. By the way, is the microphone working? You can hear okay at the back. Good. Let's go back to 1519 A.D. Anyone know what happened in that year? Right. Hernan Cortez landed on that part of Central America that is today known as Mexico. He expected to find gold, and he did. What he did not expect to find, however, was the great Aztec civilization. Aztec legend said they originated in the plains of northwestern Mexico and slowly migrated southward. When they arrived at Lake Texcoco in 1325, they founded their great capital, Tenochtitlan. On the site of what is now Mexico City, the Aztecs developed a complex society and governmental structure, at the head of which was the emperor. They made many scientific advances, especially in the areas of astronomy and medicine. They also had a complicated religion, and interest in the arts, agriculture, and social conditions occupied much of their time. Let's talk about their remarkable achievements in some of these areas. You cannot do much if you don't have food to eat. So let's first take a look at their farming practices. The land that the Aztecs farmed was not fertile enough to grow enough food to support the growing population, so they were forced to invent methods to increase productivity, including irrigation, fertilizer, and even building terraces on hills. To protect soil from running off, like we see today in China, the Philippines, and many other parts of the world, 
But one thing we don't see was their very original idea of chinapas, spelled C H I N A P A S. Chinapas were floating gardens built on swamps. Actually, they were quite simple to make. First, canals were dug through the marshes and swamps. Then, mud from the canals was placed on mats. Woven from weeds and straw, these mats were quite big, maybe five or six meters long and two across. Trees were then planted in the bed of the swamp, at the corners of each mat. The trees took root, and the chinapas were held firmly in place. The Aztecs used these floating gardens to plant their main corn and also vegetables. Like beans, chili peppers, avocados, squash, and tomatoes. The Aztecs were very advanced in some ways, but they didn't use animals or plows to help them work the land. In fact, they didn't even have the wheel. No problem. The soil on the chinapas was soft enough that pointed sticks were all they needed to plant crops on them. But the Aztecs. Were much more than imaginative gardeners; they made great advances in the sciences, especially astronomy. I'm sure many of you have heard of the Aztecs' calendar stone. It took them 52 years, from 1427 to 1479, to build the calendar stone. It was huge, a massive piece of rock, three feet thick, 12 feet in diameter. And weighing about twenty-four tons, on which they carved pictographs for the days and months of the Aztec calendar. This showed just how advanced the Aztecs were in the science of astronomy. It makes me think of the clean air they enjoyed in those days, when they could see all the stars shining so brightly in the night sky. They would have had a big problem doing this in most parts of the world nowadays, but back to the calendar stone. It had 18 months, each of 20 days, namely 360 days made one year. But they had long before worked out that there are 365 days in a year, so they added five days, which they called the nemantemi or sacrificial days. To get 365, remember, this was 103 years before the Gregorian calendar that we use today. Very sophisticated, those Aztec astronomers. And they were not only clever astronomers; the Aztecs made great advances in medicine. At the time, many Europeans looked down on the herbal medicine of the Aztecs as a heathen practice. Just like they used to look down on traditional Chinese or African medicine, but in fact, Aztec doctors could do more than even the best doctors in Europe. Their medicine was primarily based on spiritual healing and herbal healing. Spiritual, because they believed many illnesses were caused by such things as an angry god or bad birth signs. So their first step in treating an illness was always prayer, and sometimes animal sacrifice. But they also used herbal medicine, and concentrated much of their medical science on finding out what herbs could do, just like the ancient Chinese doctors. So, over generations, the Aztecs accumulated a vast knowledge of the herbs in the world around them. And the medicinal properties of each one. One difference with traditional Chinese medicine is that the Aztecs concentrated more on curing the symptoms of a disease than getting at the cause of the disease. They felt that if a god or goddess wished to make them ill, then they could do nothing about the root cause, namely a god. If the medicine worked. It meant that the gods approved of the patient getting well again. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.